Hello, I'm Quentin Parker, production assistant here at University Television, and I'm delighted to have as my guest today, Coach Bob Nielsen. Coach Nielsen has just completed his first season as head coach of the Leatherneck football team. Some of his past accomplishments in includes two NCAA Division II national titles, two Division II National Coach of the Year awards. Coach Nielsen brings that success and more to a Leatherneck program that has produced nearly 140 All-Americans. Coach, welcome to the program. It's a pleasure to have you here today. Thanks. Great to be here. We brought you here today to talk about your leadership style, your leadership skills, and how you've uh, managed to maintain that over the years. But my first question will be, what is a coach's leadership role in intercollegiate athletics, and why is that important to us? In my opinion, uh, a coach's leadership role is that as a mentor. Uh, and uh, the goal of, of that as a mentor is to try to help young men, as it is in the case in football, maximize their potential as a person, uh, a football player, and a college student. As a person, let's, let's talk about just being that person. What are some ways you try to get players to be the best person they can be? To get them to understand that, uh, that there's more to life than just uh, the snaps that occur on, on Saturday afternoon, uh, it's important that they understand that the opportunity that they have to play college football is, is unique um, and that uh, as, a, as, a, as a player and as a student athlete, giving back uh, is important. They'd also understand that football as a game uh, teaches a lot of life lessons that they can carry with them and, and apply uh, to the real world uh, as they uh, graduate and go into a uh, career path. What are some of those lessons you speak about that players can really take away from the game itself, like being on the field, kind of comparable to situations in life that, may, that they may encounter? Well, first of all, uh, football is a great team game. Uh, Eleven players playing at a time. Uh, Eleven players whose role is, is important on every, on every play. And, and uh, in, in our world today, it's uh, a, lot about, uh, a lot about me, a lot about I. And, and football is a we game, and, and, and the we is what uh, makes teams successful. The, the we attitude and approach is, is what makes people successful uh, in society. And, and so from a football standpoint and leadership standpoint, uh, one of the things that we stress always is it's, uh, it's, it's we, it's our, it's not I and mine. And, and uh, the other thing, I think football, uh, uh, no matter how good you are, you're going to get knocked down at some point in time. And it's not a measure of how often and how hard you get knocked down, but how you get back up uh, that really is the measure of, of you as a person. And uh, uh, if you can do that in the game of football and apply that to later in life, you've got a very good chance of being successful. And sometimes you need help getting up. That's correct. And taking help is something that I realized for myself even. It's very difficult to fall and then have someone help you get up over the years. I've gotten way better at understanding that it's going to take some help sometimes and teamwork is what it really comes down to. And, and certainly that help comes from leaders, whether they're coaches or peer leaders, uh, that, uh, that in a team everyone has an opportunity to be. So how did you develop this leadership, I guess, style you have over the years? Uh, from being around uh, a number of people, you know, I think back uh, growing up, uh, uh, I learned a lot from my father, uh, who, uh, you know, in 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 his in his ways, uh, he probably didn't realize the lessons that he was teaching me. You know, growing up on a farm, you, you learn the value of of hard work and and uh, how important it is to to be involved in in helping neighbors. Uh, one of the things that he really stressed uh, to me and and uh, gave me the opportunity to be involved in athletics uh, and to go to college uh, that he didn't have. And so the, the sacrifice component of that, uh, knowing that uh, you know, would have been a lot easier for him to say, hey, you've got to stay and, yeah. and help on the farm instead of chasing all around in the summer and preparing to, to play high school football and then providing me the opportunity to, to go co to, to college, which is something that, that he didn't have the opportunity to do. That's amazing. So if you were to develop, let's say, amnesia tomorrow, you, you <laughs> fell and bumped your head while you were painting your house or whatever, cleaning your gutters, and someone told you that you were a great leader one, once, and, and once upon a time, and they showed you these rings, and you're like, who is this Bob Nielsen? Who is this guy they're talking about? 
what would be one tool you would want someone to say, hey, take this and try and remember who you were? What would you use? I think the one phrase that I would probably want to, to remember is uh, one that uh, one of my mentors in coaching uh, told me once, and that leadership is about making a difference. Never think you are the difference. Um, and, and that really applies, that, uh, that as coaches, it, it's, it's about how we can help the group develop um, and uh, not, uh, not simply the fact that, that you're the one that's making a team successful. Wow, how can I make, say that again? Repeat that for me. <laughs> that uh, it's not. It's it's leadership is is really about making a difference. Making a difference. Never thinking you are the difference. Never thinking you are the difference. Okay, that's that's in the memory bank for, for <laughs> future reference. Uh, from your experience, are leaders born or are they molded some other kind of way? I think leaders are are really developed uh, through a process. Um, and uh, there certainly are some characteristics that people probably have that make them better leaders or maybe make them grasp uh, leadership concepts uh, um, easier as, as they develop. But uh, I think a lot of it has to do with experience, uh, the kind of experiences that you've had, the, the mentors that you've had. Um, I, I'm not sure there's one, um, one leadership philosophy, but it's all a, a melt of, of uh, experiences that, that people have had that bring together. Um, I always say there's a lot of right ways to coach uh, and there's a lot of successful coaches that do things differently um, but they all have an underlying, all successful coaches have, a, have an underlying uh, foundation uh, that they've developed that they believe in. Okay, uh, so great coaches learn to plan, lead, organize and evaluate all the things that they're doing. What is your best planning tool for success? Uh, I, I think there's, there's three things uh, that I would talk about. Number one is establishing a sense of belief um, and uh, in all organizations to be successful and, and leaders are the ones that, that have the biggest role in this is first of all believing that you can achieve and getting all those around you to, to uh, achieve. Um, the second piece is to build a sense of ownership uh, within the team and, and uh, or the group uh, that, uh, that you're involved with. Um, because once uh, the group has that same sense of ownership, they develop that pride and passion uh, that drives them to be successful. And, and those, so those are kind of the two foundational components that in every situation uh, that, that I've been as a head coach and I've had the opportunity to to be in, in uh, multiple different uh, uh, positions that were all at different stages of, of development. Uh, but those were the two things that I've held um, as, as the two highest priorities. We've talked about leading, so organizing. How do you organize your players and yourself and your staff for success? Um, Unfortunately, it requires that you have to have to meet a lot. I'm not yeah. a, a big meeting person, but when you have a staff, we have a staff of of uh, ten people in football. Um, you know, we meet a lot to make sure that as a staff we're organized. Uh, the NCAA says we get X number of hours a week uh, to prepare our teams, um, and that number is less than 20. Uh, and with uh, the life of college students and and uh, what they have going on in the classroom and, and social activities. We want to make sure that with those 17, 18 hours a week that we're highly organized with the time that, uh, that we have. Uh, so as a staff, we have to be organized. And so we meet daily um, as a staff, uh, talking about uh, what some people would call little things. Yeah. Uh, but little things make a big difference. And, in how that time is used and, and also uh, how productive you can be. Okay, and the last question in that vein is about evaluation. Uh, how do you evaluate yourself and everyone else around you to make sure you're on the right path? Uh, evaluation of yourself uh, is probably <laughs> uh, something that I'm really hard and critical of. Um, 
you know, I, I say uh, this year, a, a year where we didn't win as many games um, as we would have liked to. It w in, in some ways, you're harder and you work harder when you lose than when you're winning because you're constantly evaluating what we could have done differently, how we could have approached a situation or, or even as simple as what would have been a better call uh, yeah. in that situation. Um, in, in terms of evaluation our team's production, we try to break it down in such a way that it relates specifically in, in, in terms of measurable things. And we have a list of 22 objectives um, that every game we go into. And after the game on Sunday, the first thing we do is we pull up that 22 uh, item challenge board and look at those things in relationship to how we did that. And within that challenge board are kind of the fundamental principles of what we think winning football is all about. So by stressing those 22 objectives, we begin to build that sense of this is what we have to do as a team. These are the priorities that, that we have, that everyone has buy-in in that. Has this been a tool you've used over all of your time as a football coach or evaluation tool? Uh, that process has been, the actual objectives have changed a little bit yeah. and we've, we've tweaked them in terms of what they actually are, but the, the kind of matter of fact uh, um, objective evaluation um, carries uh, in coaching just like it does in business. Okay. So you mentioned you didn't win as many games as you'd like this year. And bef I mean, before the season started, you obviously had a goal for how many you thought or maybe you, you wanted to win. Um, how did you, what did you take away from this season like, as far as not getting what you wanted done? Like what, what does that, how does that play into next season? How do you change things? Uh, first of all, I've never, in, in my 21 years of being a head coach, I've, I've never started the year with, with a, a goal of we're going to win this many football okay. games. Um, the goal has always been we're going to, to be the best team that we can be every week. Uh, and I know that sounds cliche. No, but, not at all. Uh, but, and, and we're going to be playing our best football of the year at the end of the year. Um, that's what, what coaching is all about, um, is making sure that week by week the team and the program are moving forward. Uh, and uh, so even though, you know, we went through a period where we lost five straight games, you know, there were some areas that, that we did improve dramatically as a football team and some other areas that we didn't improve as well. And so our focus can always be addressing those weaknesses and maximizing strengths. And if you approach it that way, uh, your team's going to continue to advance. And, and so we look at this year and uh, this past year and with the, the record that we had, um, we have identified um, some weaknesses. We, we know we have to address those. We've also identified strengths that we can build upon as we move forward to 2014. Uh, and, uh, and, and so now as coaches, we have an opportunity to address those things. Very good. Player performance. How do you find the optimal arousal for each player, knowing you know how to deal with that player? And then how do you recognize how to deal with them as an individual and mix that together all the time? You have so, how, what's your roster, 60 players maybe? 100. 100 <laughs> players, yeah. I was thinking of the NFL yeah. or something like that. You have a very, you know, a, smaller roster mm -hmm. at that level, but you have 100 players. That's 100, let's say, maybe 50 different optimal arousal levels. How do you manage that? Over my 30 years um, of coaching, uh, I've found that every player is different in that regard. Um, I've had some that uh, will show up on game day and five hours before game time, they're dressed in full uniform, <laughs> helmet on, chin strap fastened, mouth guard in, ready to go. And, <laughs> And the flip side of that is, is the ones that, that come in uh, 10 minutes before the, the start of the game and, and look like they just uh, you know, had gotten done taking a nap and throw their gear on quickly. And, and there's a certain amount of flexibility that's important in that regard. The, the big thing that we've stressed is the things that are important uh, from, from a program standpoint are things that, that everyone's going to do the same. Right. Uh, while allowing some of that individual flexibility. Um, I'm not Newt Rockney. I don't have a, a bunch of canned uh, motivational speeches. 
Uh, my approach to that is that motivation is, a, is an internal and eternal thing. Yeah. And uh, stress that players find the way to get themselves ready to play to the utmost of their ability because it's important for them and for the team. In those players, how do you find the heart, your captain, your, your leader, and, and what do you do with it when you find it? Try to develop it. Um, Developing leaders uh, within a football program is, is a key to winning. Um, and they don't have to be seniors. You can find leaders in, in your younger player group. Uh, I challenge our players. I meet with our players uh, individually four times a year. And in those meetings, we talk about being a leader and what it takes to be a leader and, and how important that leadership is and, and challenge players to accept that role. Um, it's easy to identify the ones that are looked to by their peers, and 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 uh, and so when you when you see that, you take those young men and challenge them with the responsibility and and the abilities that they have. So, what are some? Uh, I guess I would say negative or not so sought after events that could happen in a player's career that would be actually pretty positive to them, like maybe an injury or um, uh, an accident that they had, what kind of situation can help a player in the end? You see a lot, uh, unfortunately, in football, you, you see a lot of players that have to deal with injury and, and responding back from, from injury and, or how they deal being injured and not playing. It, 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 there are some players that handle that very well and can continue to be a really good leader for your football team even though they're not yeah. playing on, on Saturdays. Um, you also, uh, uh, we do a, a little segment uh, at the end of practice where we provide the opportunity for every one of our players at, at one time during the season to stand in front of the team and, and to talk about what football means to them, what being a part of the team means to them. And, and when you have them in that position, um, it's interesting to hear them say, you know, what influences yeah. have, have gotten them to that point. And, you find out that there are things that they have went through, um, whether it's early on or, or through high school or even while they've been at, at, at college, that uh, have stressed the importance of the game and the team environment to them. How important is scheduling to making sure your team is ready to play at the end of the year? Uh, it, scheduling, um, uh, I, I've been a proponent from a game scheduling concept to, to always try to schedule quality opponents early uh, when you have the opportunity to do that in non-conference scheduling. Um, and and uh, because I think teams need to see the level of play uh, early on and uh, once once they've they've established themselves as a team that uh, can play at that level, gain, you gain great confidence. And, and even if you lose one of those games early on, uh, this year, for example, we go up to Minnesota and play a very good Minnesota team in an environment where nobody expects you to be competitive, and we play a very competitive football game. I really think that helped us uh, continue to be competitive through, throughout the year. Um, from a coaching standpoint, one of the other things you have to do is with your scheduling as the season wears on, it's always a delicate balance of, of, of finding ways for your team to improve um, and in a contact sport without creating more injuries. Right. Um, and so the balance there becomes more, um, you know, less contact work on the field, uh, more, uh, more film work, more video work. Uh, uh, things that you can do at a slower tempo. What would be one lesson that you've had over time that inspired you to be the leader you are today? I know you mentioned your, your father, but mm -hmm. give me some different uh, experiences you've had in the coaching world that have given you that one thing you can look back at and, and gather yourself from. Yeah. Um, you know, my first coaching experience was was at an assistant coach at, at the Division three level and, and uh, where I I had graduated and uh, the head coach that had ended up bringing me to that place offered me a full-time job and so I had the opportunity to, to be uh, a coach at 22 years of age where I was really coaching 
guys that I had been in school with. And uh, uh, I learned from that very quickly how you've got to um, transition yourself um, and uh, maybe grew up a little bit <laughs> quicker than a lot of people do in the coaching profession. Uh, he was also a, a guy that uh, I learned a lot from. Um, and I say I learned maybe not a lot about football from him, but I learned a lot about people and, and the importance of, of, uh, of, uh, of, of the coaching standpoint as a mentor and, and uh, other than, than just uh, as an on-the-field coach. Um, probably the, the other um, uh, person that had a dramatic influence is one of the early years as a head coach, uh, I hired as an assistant coach um, a longtime college coach who had retired uh, from the profession and was able to, to get him to come back. And, I can remember sitting and having a lot of philosophical conversations and he was a highly successful uh, uh, had coached at the Division I level for a number of years, um, recognized throughout the, the country as one of the top offensive line coaches. And I can remember uh, sitting with him one day and picking his brain about uh, um, coaching and, and his one point that really stuck with me is that uh, the young men that you're working with will, will always play as hard as they possibly can as long as they know that you care about them. And, and that stuck with me and certainly as a coach, you know, my, my belief as a, as a mentor and a, and a caretaker um, is, is something that I think once you lose that in this profession, you might as well retire. And I think that's, a, that's kind of the underlying thing for successful coaches. They honestly care more about those players than they care about themselves. And the ones that can manage to keep everything at an even keel, take care of home, take care of the church, the community, and also take care of their players are a little bit more successful because you're not about you anymore. It's about them. It's about, your, it's about making them happy and seeing them succeed. Because in a way, uh, I have a seven-year-old. I mean, I feel like I've done everything I need to do, even though I really haven't. So my goal is to get her ready, you know, to help her prepare, to do anything I can to be there for her. So it's, I, I think that's something that I can take from what you just said and, and, and just pour it right into the cup that I have. So yep. good, good coaches are always themselves yeah. and they're always consistent. Yeah. <laughs> when you uh, were making national championship runs, uh, what was one thing that stands out in your mind that you keep from those times? Both of those teams uh, were teams that uh, had tremendous leaders. Um, you know, in 2008, I took back over a program that had only won four games the year before, and and that that year transitioned to 15 and 0 in a national championship. And uh, I think back at that team, and I think of the leadership that was on that team, and and the desire that that team had to to be to to be successful and. And um, it, it, it really reinforced the fact that leadership is more than just the head coach. It's, it's everybody involved and, and you have to have that buy-in and ownership that I talked about earlier. Um, the other thing is that all of those teams were teams that dealt well with adversity. Um, in 2010, uh, we lost our best player, an All-American running back uh, mid-season and I can remember our coaching staff saying well that's it you know we're, we're we're probably done and I said no because I think our team still believes. David Neto from 32 and a chance for the title. Neto the kick is good and UND wins it and Minnesota Duluth wins their second NCAA Division II football title, courtesy of David Neto. And, uh, and so the sense of belief at that point was so strong that we were able to carry through that injury. We lost our second best offensive player three weeks later and uh, continued to find ways to, to win football games. So the power of belief and, and uh, that uh, reinforcement of of, of leadership throughout the program is, is critical. So do you think that um, coaching 
12 All-Americans and five mm -hmm. players of the year um, gives you a different perspective as opposed to, I mean, let's say you had coached those teams and you didn't have as, you had maybe 100 just really good players as opposed to maybe 12 All-Americans on one team. Do you think you learn more from having those players or do you think you would have learned more from having maybe less All-Americans total? Um, it's not necessarily the All-Americans that you learn from. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, you, I, coaching as long as I've had, you know, and probably now in the thousands in terms of players that I've actually, you know, coached over, over uh, 21 years as a head coach and another nine years as an assistant coach. Um, it's, you learn, you learn from every player. Um, and we've had a lot of, of really good players. Um, but what's made them good is the, the teams that they've been on. Um, okay. All American players and, and, and players of the year uh, are normally uh, selected because the teams have been successful and the players around them have helped them to be successful. And uh, honestly, I think of all of those players of the year and the All-Americans that we've had, they'll be the first ones to talk about their teammates yeah. and how they've made them successful. So my final question is about Western. What it, how much different is your plan for success going to be here at Western than it has been in the past? Well, the first step in any plan is evaluation. Um, so, so getting here, you know, over the course of the first few months, um, the work was to evaluate the situation and, and where we needed to go. My underlying um, um, priorities are, are still going to be the same, but how close were we? Where, where did we have the biggest gaps in, in where we were at and where we eventually want to get to? Uh, and then addressing that as a plan. Every, every situation is different um, and, and in terms of where they're at and, and what the strengths of that place are. And, and how far they need to, to move in, in one area or another. And, and so that evaluation component uh, you know, took place. Uh, we're still probably doing that a little bit. Um, but uh, you know, the, the road to, to success and is, is sometimes bumpy. <laughs> and uh, we've had some bumps along the way this year. And, but at the same time, we're, we're going the right direction. And, and uh, as a leader now, we've got to capitalize on the momentum that we generated uh, this year and, and make that quantum leap uh, in the future. Well, Coach, thank you so much. And welcome to the Western Illinois University family. We all wish you the best in your next season. And thank you very much for being on our program. My pleasure. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. I'd also like to thank the University Television staff, Visual Production, the Athletic Department staff, and everyone else for all of their hard work and cooperation in putting this program together. So until next time, I'm Quentin Parker encouraging you to go out into your community and reach for the Leadership Summit. Have a great day.